Hoy hoy, listeners, and welcome to episode four of the Grand Turiz Bros podcast, starring the lovely and handsome Eddie Juarez Gomez and myself, Tristan Roadbeef Bayless. We've got a lovely panel in store for you tonight, covering such topics as the new Gran Turismo Sport regional splits, some reports from the Gran Turismo Sport offseason, and something I know we are both quite excited for, the Pinnacle GT Championship. If we have time tonight, we may also touch on the recently completed McLaren Shadow Competition that I believe Igor was in, uh, our good friend Igor Fraga, the end of the Formula One season, and is becoming usual with the Turiz Bros, a peppering of the random. Eddie, how are you doing tonight? Woo! Well, let me tell you what, Tristan, after a beautiful intro from a beautiful person such as yourself, like that one, I feel great. <laughs> I feel pumped. I'm ready to go. We're hitting the ground running with some Gran Turismo Sports. Oh, yeah. Or sport news, stuff, speculation, and, you know, disappointment. A little bit of that, too. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. We've got a big update coming this month. we got new cars, we got the new track, and we've got a division of regions. Tell me what that means. Yes, sir. In fact, the Earth, the Gran Turismo Sport Spheroid has cracked from three shards into five Oh my goodness. Five Previously, shards. Yeah. Previously on Gran Turismo Sports, we had three regions. And if, uh, in case you didn't know, <laughs> I mean, that's part of the thing, right? Is everyone was isolated. So it's like, uh, yeah, I don't ever race with anyone outside of my region. So, mm-hmm. uh, but now they're splitting it up even more. So that means North America and South America are going to be split up. And then Australia, New Zealand, or Oceania. And the rest of Asia are split up. Hmm. So, unfortunately, that sucks because we can't race with our Brazilian friends anymore, South American friends. Um, It's too bad. Wasn't it mostly to do, you think, with uh, uh, latency between um, the distances of, like, North and South America and Japan and Australia, for example? Um, I don't know if it's so much that as it is the uh, whole... I, I don't know. I mean, I, we can speculate, right? And I th- I was honestly thinking that maybe they were thinking, well, why don't we have all North America guys will go to Vegas, and then South America guys will have them all go to, or Central and South America will all go to probably what I would, I would say Brazil. Mm-hmm. You know, Igor's the star of Gran Turismo for good, you know, for good reason. And I think him doing so well maybe brought some you know like it's like what every time america they have like miss world the next Mm -hmm. miss world is usually held at the country of the girl that won so that's true something like that that would be nice you know we it makes me think that maybe the best case scenario of uh uh, of finding an explanation for the splits is maybe there's more funding approved for the competition next year and they're going to have five regional finals instead of three yeah maybe no more world tour things and just all yeah, they'll have five regionals, which yeah. would be cool. I am but, bummed about not being able to race the fellow Brazilian South Americans, though. Um, yeah. I wish there was a way. I wish that, like, in the exhibition season, they uh, had, like, a, a one-off week where there was a server in Hawaii so Japanese and awesome. American drivers could go against each other with low latency or something like that. It would be amazing. That's an awesome idea. I would really love some crossover events like that. I think the, they would prove to be really popular. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if anyone's listening, <laughs> sorry, I hate myself sometimes. Uh, but well, like the 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 non in person uh, top twenty four races that uh, like Jimmy Broadbent uh, and Co uh, commentated upon um, were super popular. Um, you know, I made yeah. time to tune into that, even though I couldn't compete. So if they had something like that for uh, you know Nick's the World Tour and instead have kind of like a. Uh, you know, special internet only event, but uh, still broadcasted and live streamed with commentary. Um, I mean, we'll get to Pinnacle. Uh, Pinnacle, man, it, that's so excited to do that. Um, but yeah, this this Gran Turismo stuff. Uh, it sounds like if they split the regions, that means they're going to have uh, you'd think more staff to manage the the additional two regions. Um, and if if that means that investment is only getting bigger for next year, then uh, I think that we can call this year a success on that result. Yeah, I'll definitely say so. It's getting a lot of press and attention. Uh, if you haven't 
um, go ahead and Google. Uh, I'll try to maybe include it as a link in the description for the YouTube video on the podcast uh, RSS stuff. But uh, in case I forget, Google Forbes and then Gran Turismo, and you should see the cool article they wrote talking all about it. And it was, you know, singing all kinds of awesome stuff about how realistic it is in the future and nice uh, things like that. But uh, going more into what I think is going on for the regional split is I also was considering that they don't want to spend these... Well, it can be sort of crazy to send people across the hemisphere, right? Yeah. So Brazilians coming up here and such, so... That would also that could also be a part of it, but um, yeah, you think the, that they're the way that they're, they're probably over overspending at this point. Um, yeah. yeah, like how do how do Olympians pay for getting to the Olympics? Is it like their individual country's Olympic committee is paying for them, or are they paying their own way? Um, you know, so far all these guys have been uh, comped by uh, Gran Turismo themselves, and. Uh, you know, it's it's been a great thing, but maybe it's not going to last forever. If uh, we get even more participation, that might be a, a new expectation for people to find their own way if they do qualify. Yeah, and the and this might also change aspects of regionals as well for Nations Cup um, and manufacturer and how that all works, since there's only 16 slots. Unless they increase it, which would be crazy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, they. It may be a case of them wanting to uh, just continue to focus people that are in the regions that... uh, Sorry, save me here. I was just... I had a different point, but I forgot (laughs) what I was going to (laughs) say. No, it doesn't your fault. That's what happens when Tristan interrupts somebody. (laughs) My bad, dude. No. No, it's not your bad at all. It's something about the regions people flying around anyway well what i was going to bring up uh related to that was that well no we can race with other people or other regions that's always been a thing with alternate accounts you can make you know road beef beef like road beefo or how do you <laughs> how do you latinize your Compadre, name road beefo. <laughs> <laughs> i'm here to save you <laughs> That'd be your like Mexican alternate account. Yep. I mean, Igor Fraga is a super nice guy, but that name is very uh, villainous. Yeah, it's awesome. It's a villainous uh, Bond villain thing. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but oh yeah, we, I was talking about how regionals is going to be split up, right? And then because of that, the the way that the FIA Nations Cup regionals. Or, so regions are split, but the regionals could be different, and that it won't necessarily be 30 guys again. Mm-hmm. They may even reduce it to 16 or something like that, or yeah. 20. Yeah, it, it may mean that like it not, might not be 10 Americans that go, it might be 8 Americans, or it might be 16 Americans. It's, uh, yeah, we don't know. Yeah, um, but like that's all thrown up in the air, and, and hopefully we don't get um, countries poorly represented in, in, in participation just because uh, a rule set is... Uh, for a few countries is is kind of glossed over. That would be very unfortunate. Very much so. But moving on now to the exhibition series, which happened in Gran Turismo Sports. It's been going on since the FIA Online Championship concluded back in, what, August? It was like September, the first week of September the last rounds were. And so now we're, we just finished season three of the exhibition series on last Saturday. And I have just now, today, got my rig back up and running finally. Mm -hmm. Nice dude. It's been a wild, it's been a little break that I've taken, but it was kind of necessary. Yeah. It was necessary. uh, But I'm really eager to get back on and try to do some fast stuff on track. And but I have been keeping in check the whole time with our little WhatsApp app, WhatsApp group that we have, mm-hmm. and seeing how everyone's doing with the races and how they've been for you. Because I know you've run a majority of them, right? Yeah, you know they've been trying a lot of new stuff uh, with uh, uh, a few races where tuning is allowed. Spec races like for an old mini, um, they've been throwing in medium and soft tires with the high tire where they have reduced fuel consumption across the board. So. Um, 
some people who who really excelled at uh, uh, metering their fuel consumption, lifting in a draft, uh, dialing up the fuel map to six in a draft. Uh, Lloyd's is the the best person I can think of who is it's just tremendous at that. Uh, is for the last few seasons hasn't been a factor since Vegas. I think they've they've really started to branch into experimental stuff. Uh, it it looks like since they released the season four schedule that they're going to continue, which is uh, great. With you know trying out the different combos, I think they want to see what uh, what kind of varied strategies they get. Are people going to one stop on mediums? Are they going to two stop on softs, etc. Um, I completed the manufacturer series championship for season three and had like a season long battle with, uh, Daniel Dodge lamb. Uh, he ended up winning. Congratulations to him. I'm not bitter at all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but I think, I think it's, you know, at, at, they had to kind of stay to a consistent rule set up to the, uh, regional finals so that um, I think probably just to make sure not to people many people were upset and everyone had time to kind of acclimate to the fuel savings uh, uh, importance uh, and then once they got to the regional final then they're like okay we're flipping the table and now it's time to try uh, everything else so um, you know looking at next year it's it's probably only going to get more complicated um, and more challenging and that may see a brand new breed of driver emerge uh, as like top tier so uh, that'll be interesting to follow. Yeah, that's a great thing to do. You have to kind of rattle the case every once in a while and see how people adapt. And the cream does rise to the top uh, eventually, and especially when you have a good group of guys that you're plugged in with and trading little tips on, which is huge. Anyone out there that you know is trying to fly it solo, it's really a no-no. Okay. Yeah, it's really bad to do. You gotta fly with the wingman at least, a good wingman with a strong beard. Yeah, and either that that or if you are gonna fly solo, at least go to you know the red flag exercises all the time. <laughs> yeah, uh, like for that. lack of a better metaphor, um, and just try to engage with uh, the competitors that might be faster than you. Um, it's it's tough to be willing to race and be willing to lose because none of us like losing. Uh, I get red in the face after I lose. <laughs> And sometimes I get, you know, pissed off at everything. You know, stupid shoe <laughs> after I lose. You know, it's right. like, dumb bottle in the way. Ugh. But uh, once once that, like, emotive uh, uh, initial reaction passes, the, the reflection is just so valuable. And if, if you're just winning all the time, yeah, it feels good, but um, you're about to be passed. And if you're not reflecting critically... And and really trying the new stuff the next time you go out to see if you can beat the guy that you couldn't beat before, how else you're going to improve? Exactly, very well said. And what is up with manufacturers still not changing, man? Yeah, they said someone specifically said, "Oh, that tag, how it says 2019, those that, that weird <laughs> ID code, ended up being actually true." It's gonna. It seems like we're going to have to keep those, these manufacturers until 2019, and it's hilarious because Hell's Fire totally picked like Aston Martin on a whim. Yep. He's like, I will pick this main, and you'll be okay for next season. And then in the <laughs> he didn't have next season. Next season that he gets changed, it's 2019, bro. It's like, uh That's pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he loves doing that, though. He, uh, Hell's Fire is one that does – he likes to – you know, he doesn't stick with one brand. He liked trying all kinds, which is good. But in this case, it ended up doing him in, dude. Yep. I'm not as brave as some guys. I think it, uh, it's like NZ who picked McLaren. I forget who it was. But oh, uh, for the for the final FIA season, the, I think so. That's that was brave. Very brave. Yeah, he he was on McLaren, which is nuts. They were like second to last, I think. But I picked Chevy once I got back on when I signed my first signing in the off season was Chevy. Mm-hmm. So I'm not mad at that. <laughs> not too bad, except I think Group Four is kind of a joke. But yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty unbalanced. It seems still um, where uh, what I've the consensus I've read is uh, the the lighter cars are always going to be better, um, even if they have a lot less power because they're not wearing out the tires. Um, I think that, Group Four. Yeah, Group Four. So yeah. so like the Cayman I'm always in. Uh, is very kind to its tires. I can do like, I did Monza, um, the third to last round, I think, um, maybe midway through the season against Dodge Lamb head to head and he was in the Alpha 4C. Um, and he, he ran softs. He was able to make softs last the whole race. I had to run mediums, 
but had like half of my tires left by the end of the race. Probably could have run softs, and I think everyone else um, had to run mediums, and maybe half the fields had to pit for tires. Um, it, it it seems like there's there's more BOP adjustment that needs to happen. Um, in the Gran Turismo family WhatsApp chat, uh, we've come up with uh, several suggestions. Everyone's kind of brainstorming. It would be great if there was like a polyphony digital um, ghost who's watching and always listening and tabulating the the, the best suggestions. Maybe, um, you know, uh, if it is a championship, why not have like a weight penalty? Um, something that can equalize the field by halfway through the championship. But that's just one of many suggestions. So uh, yeah. we're we know they're in an experimental phase, and maybe they'll start experimenting with that um, before the next official season. Well, that's a great segue, my friend, because you just dropped the B word, ballast. That's a feature of the club league that we run in, which is called Pinnacle GT. Mm-hmm. You can find out more information about that illustrious league on bitly.com or i'm sorry bit.ly so bit.ly slash pgt info and again callers it is bit.ly slash pgt info that's where you'll find all the information about how the series works it is quite involved there's safety cars there are uh, manual grid starts there are <clears throat> there is uh, ballast adjustments that happens, or, or win- winners' success ballast, or whatever you want to call it, success penalties, mm-hmm. which ke- are well, we haven't seen them yet because the off season is going on right now. The full season starts in January, and that's when we'll see how that all works out. But there are three compounds that you can choose from for each race. There's qualifying that leads up in during the week, leads up to the setting the grid order on Thursday, and then <clears throat> excuse me, and then the, that grid order is used for the race on Sunday. So it's uh, pretty cool because every week the divisions get set. So currently we have over 70 drivers. So that means there may be upwards of four divisions mm-hmm. for every race. And they happen bi-weekly. So there's one race. If you're in Division 1 or 2, you race on the first Sunday. And then the following Sunday, Division 3 and 4 race. And then it goes back to D1, T2 for the next round and the next Sunday. Those divisions are separated uh, by qualifying time, is that correct? Yep. So uh, there's 13 drivers allowed in each lobby. Uh, There are three spots reserved for broadcaster, uh, race director, and safety car driver, which there actually is one of. Someone goes out in one of those, you know, and it's about time someone uses those those sweets. Yeah, they've got like five of them, I think. There's the, the AMG, there's the BMW, there's the Nissan. Uh, and I think there's maybe like one or two others I, I can't remember, but at least yeah. three safety cars. Um, I think it's awesome, dude. Uh, yeah. Race to play this this league I used to race in had uh, a lot of the same stuff that Pinnacle are are pushing forth with, like manual formation laps, um, safety cars, full course yellows. It's uh, you know it's it's stuff that the Gran Turismo Sport doesn't really have implemented um, from a, a technical side but when you have people who are in control of it and manually implementing it as long as everyone is up to speed with the rules then it can uh, certainly add many layers many depths of uh, realism um, and therefore consequence and uh, involvement and if uh, we're even more careful when we're racing each other in that league uh, with heavy damage on as well um, I mean that that can only be a good thing It, it can only improve everyone's race craft and sportsmanship uh, I think one thing that is really important that they have is how uh, if you've got damage and you need to pit stop to um, fix it, you can only fix the damage. You can't take tires or fuel. So you'd have to make a second stop to then you know do your regular uh, fuel and tire change. Um, that really drives home the consequence of uh, incurring damage. Um, it's a great thing. It, it's uh, you know we did the one test race already. That I participated in and that made me uh, like extra extra dubious and cautious. Um, much more so than I would be in like a daily race. Um, it, it really matters because the the final result consequence is huge. Yeah, it turns it into me feeling more of, to the likes of like an eye racing experience where the damage is really critical, yeah. and you do have to be super careful and think, you know, think way more about what you're going to do before you do it, which is great. And I like the 
the, you know, the way that's gotten started with Brian Voice uh, being the, the head honcho, I've been helping him. I'm kind of like his right hand man, helping him uh, kind of get, you know, with perspective. I have like a long history of running leagues in Gran Turismo since GT5. Yeah, dude. Uh, we have a fun Discord where we organize everything. Good group of dudes, and they do it all. Uh, try to, and they promote uh, the Alan B. Parsons Project Cancer Research Fund. Uh, Pearson, sorry, uh, which is great, and they have a ton of real talent in the field. That's uh, what's gotten me the most excited for this coming season. We have um, Andrew Waring, which is known. Well, he is also known as Monster Sport, the winner of the FAF World Gaming Competition, or yeah, World Gaming Competition mm-hmm. Canadian tournament that gave out a bunch of money for the winners. Um, Race Boy seventy seven in it is in it, which is one of the biggest Forza streamers who actually works for Forza now or Forza RC. Nice. Uh, then you also have Road Beef, the mm. diabolically fast you know, Ring County guy. <laughs> I'm a choke artist. Just wait I'm for me to hit artist. that wall. <laughs> uh, yeah, humble pie all day. But uh, who else is in there? I mean I'm sure I'm forgetting some names. It we're doing a podcast right now. I can't. I really think. Remember I think uh, Stagger. Stagger joined. Stagger is there too. Yeah, Armin's going to be in there. Um, there's a there's a few other names uh, I couldn't remember. I think one of was uh, an, a guy I recognized from Race to Play, Sean Yoder. Um, I, I haven't seen him sign up for an event, but I, I saw his uh, name in the member list. Um, yeah. You know, and and I think that, I mean, the the pinnacle is going to be awesome, dude. We got. Um, the races are broadcasted, but so are two the qualifying sessions. Yeah. Um, and uh, this is like only my fourth podcast ever, but I'm being brave and I'm going to do uh, the qualifying commentary on Wednesday. Um, I went out to Best Buy today and bought another keyboard so I can have those nifty camera and replay controls all set up. Um, cool. Try to hit it out of the park, That's my man. Awesome. Are you going to do Tuesday or Thursday? Cause uh, I'll Thursday have to Wednesday. check. <laughs> I thought it was Wednesday. It's okay. Uh, I'll probably do Thursday, okay. but uh, we'll see. Um, I got to trade in my Volkswagen TDI on Wednesday. Finally, the whole Dieselgate thing, but that's a, oh, really? a different topic entirely. Oh wow! Yeah, that's so. Nice. But yes, yeah. Pinnacle is going to be great. Uh, tune in also to the Facebook page if you type Pinnacle ZT in the Facebook. That's where they stream the races on Facebook Live. And then we have some really, really talented commentators, uh, of which Tristan has joined the fold with, and I think is going to be a great addition for. Oh boy! And thank you. So yeah, you can check out the previous race that's already happened on the Facebook page as well. It's uh, really interesting. There's a lot of, you know, there's some interesting. We're getting going, starting a new format, trying to figure it out. So it's it's fun. It's exciting. Everything's you know. Uh, changing from race to race, uh, adjusting, tweaking. It's a fun mm-hmm. process. It is. It's the groundwork is laid. Uh, I think it's going to take off. Um, you know, we're or the timing couldn't be better. Uh, a winter series exactly. prior to Gran Turismo starting the official series. Um, everybody's going to be dipping their feet into uh, their own streams. Um, it feels like Pinnacle is going to welcome things like post race reports, uh, uh, action screenshots, uh, the sharing of, of everything. It'd be cool if they, uh, uh, were able to implement like a tagging system or something like that. But that's also, that's like wishlist stuff. Uh, I think that the attention it will gather is only going to get larger. Um, and, uh, the thing I most look forward to is racing you on track again. So. Yeah. You better, you better practice up, my friend. Yes, dude. I will be doing that for the good of both of us, for the <laughs> so that we uh, can both have some fun and and go out and put it all out there. Very much so. Yes, looking forward to that. I am the key master. Are you the gatekeeper? Yes, I am. <laughs> there is no Wardes. There is only Zul. <laughs> Zulu. Zulu. So. What was the other thing that I was going to mention about Pinnacle? Oh, follow Pinnacle on all the social media platforms. Facebook, Instagram, Pinnacle GT on f- Instagram, Pinnacle GT on Twitter, and Pinnacle GT on your 
favorite. Uh, never mind. I was gonna use it. I was gonna say a joke, but never mind. <laughs> I'm gonna keep it serious for, <laughs> for the rest of the pinnacle uh, outro there. But uh, we're gonna move on to talking about quickly because you know I gotta say it up front. McLaren Shadow Project, although it was supposed to be a, a, a tournament involving all the cool racing games, didn't mm-hmm. include GT Sport. It was uh, they they did i racing last year, and this year it was what was it like Project Cars and Forza or something? Well, this year, last year they did a few different games, but this year they all they did uh, for this tournament. It was. Uh, starting out, I think it was R Factor 2, and then they went to iRacing, and then they also had Forza, and then they went over to Real Racing 3 on iPads. Hmm. Alright. <laughs> I mean, covering Which all the disciplines. Hilarious. Yeah. And so they had the Real Racing 3 guy, like top guys there, going against, like, guys like Igor Fraga and some of the other crazy aliens that were there. Mm-hmm. Like Henrik, who I think came from, or no, not Henrik, um, forget Miguel from Project Cars 2 was there. Uh, those guys are really fast. And Project Cars 2 was interesting to see on the stream because, um, it was, everyone, you know, the, the real racing guys struggled, the Forza guys struggled in the Sims, as expected. But Igor had a great run in all of his races except for the Forza race, which was at Spa where he got I'm not sure if he took himself out or not. Uh, I saw a quick flash of the highlights of that part, but he had a crash, so that unfortunately left him trailing. But he dominated three of the races, so hmm. just missed out on the top spot, but he was able to go through the finals, which are happening in January. Gotcha. Still a fun stream to check out. Uh, although it's not the way I would ran things, obviously, I still really appreciate that Logitech and McLaren got together to do some something as cool as this. And there's a lot of stuff. I mean, tune if you keep uh, if you follow me on Twitter, I try to promote as much of this stuff as possible. I'm at Wardez Racing on Twitter. I promote as much esports sim racing stuff as possible. Um, one of the things besides McLaren Shadow Project is also the uh, Race of Champions that's going to happen. They're doing an E Race of Champions or E Rock. Oh snap! Yeah, it's not just a, an American invasion anymore. It's some racing that people do electronically in order to figure out who the best is in the Invitational. And mm-hmm. the two there are two spots for sim racers. I think if I got the rules, if I if I remember correctly, the rules, there are two spots and two sim drivers are gonna have the chance to compete in the actual race of champions in Mexico City. Nice, which is gonna happen soon. That's amazing. Yeah, so we'll get to see how these guys do. Last year, uh, Rudy Van Buren, I think his name was, mm-hmm. or something like that. He he was a winner of McLaren Shadow Project last year. Kicked ass in the real cars. Like he beat legit racers. And there's nothing better to see than a fellow sim racer getting out on track and showing uh, the world our worth, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure, dude. The we always uh, you and I know that the crossover has been there for a long time, and now we just have the the publicity, the saturation, and they're going to have to sit up and take notice because it's hard to ignore raw talent once it arrives on the scene. Yeah, seriously. And you can see it so well in Sims. I mean, it's just, it's, it's like, yeah, it, it illuminates the, the hidden talent within a, a lot of people. I mean, I've had friends get on the Sims and even though they're not fast right away, uh, I can tell like, yeah, they, they have something. They, they know intuitively what, how like oversteer, understeer, and that type of thing. Things that there there are a lot of tips. If you're trying to coach someone to drive in a sim, there are tips and stuff that you can say, like little things that here and there you can give them advice with. But a lot of there's a lot to driving in sims and in racing in general that's like just impossible to describe. And you kind of have to have this, and you have to have a certain level of natural talent or natural understanding in order to be really 
to be able to have fun with it right away and to be able to to continue to develop yourself on on sims mm-hmm. and that's what's great about it it's just uh it shines a light on talent that people may otherwise not have known of yep so man you know and i hope uh i don't know if you saw when um i racing took uh gregor hutu to oh, yeah. a uh, formula mazda the formula test Ma- yeah, at road mazda. atlanta i hope that that happens a little more often i mean it, the gran turismo is is kind <laughs> of a culmination to that whole thing but gregor hutu specifically uh i want to see more of that guy um, because he is, yeah. he has been for like two decades now the ultimate benchmark, and I know I, I hear he's still going at it. You know, he was like a nine-time iRacing Grand Prix champion or something like that. Yeah. Um, uh, I hope I hope he continues to cross over and try other sims. And what if he one day shows up, uh, you know, in a server with with us in Gran Turismo? Oh, that'd be great. Um, I might lose my mind. That'd be amazing. Yeah, I'm definitely a fangirl of his for sure. He's the he's the Kimmy of uh, sim racing. <laughs> he's very quiet, yeah. super Finnish, and uh, he's extremely fast. He was the very first. He, I think he was like really the, the first person to be called an alien. I mean, alien's been around for a while, but he's like the first that really um, represented that whole idea of <laughs> extremely well. You know, he was a robot. And never. He was insanely consistent. He's uh, one of the core members of Team Redline. If you don't know who he is, I'll give you a brief rundown. So. Gregor Hutu is known to be the fastest sim driver in like R Factor and iRacing for a long time. Uh, look up some of his videos, some of his laps. It's like watching Picasso paint. It's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, he's kind of dropped off, not in the sense of talent, but just I feel like he's not as active anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, the guy that I feel like is taking the mantle somewhat from him, or he, cause since he's in the same team, I feel like maybe it's his uh, more an idea of Gregor handing it to him with and the guy I'm talking about is Bono Huis, mm-hmm. who is he has won a lot of stuff. Uh, he also has won. He's really he's younger. I think he's only 20, and he's won the iRacing Grand Prix thing. Uh, and he's on Team Redline. And yeah, those guys are are a different breed. And one thing that's interesting though is that they had recently Brandon Lee won the second season of the Formula One eSports series. And big congrats on that to him. He's actually a teammate of mine on the Cars team, eSports and Cars team. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bono Huis was actually in that race. Nice. And he was racing for McLaren. He was part of the McLaren team with the McLaren Shadow Project. And um, he was only finishing like 10th, 11th. It was like he was actually in a McLaren. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, Bono. Uh, so it's tough. He won, it, didn't he win the first F1 esports championship like last year? Yeah. I want to say uh, Bono. No, he won the actual. He actually won the Formula E esports. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Formula Formula E, excuse uh, me. which I was at. It was in Vegas. It was it was at CES, and I was actually attending it. Oh wow! I snuck in as a stagehand, but <laughs> uh, it was funny. I was sitting amongst this insane crowd of like FIA racing dudes that were just like way better dressed than i was but that was an experience i'll probably tell somewhere else other time but it was cool watching him and felix rosenquist who i i became a huge fan of his after that because he was able to hang with bono Huis and like race him head to head nice this guy is insane and everyone keeps talking about how he's like the greatest swedish talent to come out of sweden uh (laughs) for a long time Mm -hmm. and he could just be fast in any car, and whether it's sim racing or real life, it's uh, really impressive. And I think Gregor Hutu was there too mm-hmm. in that race. I Rosenquist forget. is he um, a DTM racer? Uh, he's in yeah. Formula E, but he was in DTM as well. I think, yeah. Okay, that's awesome. Um, just more and more crossover. Oh yeah, that was really cool. But uh, yeah, so in F one esports, that was interesting because. Uh, your talent doesn't necessarily if if you're an insanely good i racer that doesn't mean you can just go down to a quote lesser game and be fast right there are elements of it that are cuz not every game can be absolutely perfect Un- until we simulate reality perfectly 
the crossover between trying to be fast in one game versus another is going to be quite a hurdle. And that's why I respect Igor a lot, because he seems to be the chameleon of, of sim racing. He can just adapt, adapt like no one else can going from game to game. It's just, and he can play within GT Sport. There are legends of him, you know, picking up a controller and being just like super close to his wheel times and playing with a different view and not ha- not it not really affecting him too much. You know, these mm-hmm. are things that we spend hours thinking about and, and trying to figure out like what what's the optimal view, what's the optimal wheel, how can you know? And this guy, this Igor can just go. He doesn't care. He just goes into whatever. He uses a T one fifty, you know, when he's traveling. The Thrustmaster wheel, which is, the pedals are just ridiculous, and mm-hmm. so he can be fast with that too. So he's kind of like a meme. You can see the trigonometry uh, occurring in his head in <laughs> real time, all the like the triangulations and uh, uh, radius calculations and Dude, trajectories yeah. and vectors. Igor face is a real thing. Just watch the streams. It is. It's, it's amazing the the focus he was keeping. Um, like you, you, it was completely hiding all emotion until the moment he crossed the line. Uh, and that's, I don't yeah. think something that I could do. It, uh, hypothetically, if I'm uh, about to win I'd a be, race, I'd, I'd be like losing my mind in the last few corners. Seriously, in the last few laps, I'd be gritting my teeth, I'd be sweating, I'd be wiping my eyebrows, I'd be trying to drink water, I'd be asking people around me for water. <laughs> <laughs> I need water, I'm gonna die. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, it's a, it's a quite a thing to watch him compete. At that level, and he, and then you know, the more experience he gets, the more of a monster he becomes, right? Because mm. he he has F one esports under his belt. He has this um, McLaren Shadow project under his belt. He has the Nations Cup under his belt. Like it's he's Mister No Big Deal now. Like we're the only ones that really see it as like this insane. I mean, not that he he definitely respects it, and he's going to come back trying as hard as ever. But he's been there, done that, and that's an advantage for sure. Mm-hmm. I think Igor has a very bright future, and I I do hope that um, he doesn't immediately get into like a Indy Lights championship and, and oh yeah yeah or that or that. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just um, you know, it's it's a selfish hope that I hope he returns to the next season of Gran Turismo Sport. Um, you know, trying to chase him was so uh, was great. Yes, he's great. Well, he's going to be in a different region now. Boo hoo! Yeah, that sucks. But. I'm still gonna check his, t- his times out and have my alt account see if we can d- get on track to get. Well, there will there will always be lobbies, right? You can't we'll take stock that him. away from us. You know, if there's gonna be yeah. different regions and we like come Stocking. up with uh, alt accounts, then maybe we can uh, uh, engage in some psyops <laughs> 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 and uh, you know try to pull a fast one or like uh, be like, oh yeah, we're brand new. We're like a you know new the Gran Turismo Sport never played before. I'm, I just bought a wheel. It's fresh out of its packaging. And then like lay out, lay down a time that's identical to his and he'll be like, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> Get him like second guessing all of his preparation. And, uh, and then we just show up on race day on our regular account and be like, why are you, why are you off the pace, Igor? What's wrong? Did you get rattled by someone? What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Dang. Now you're thinking like a Ferrari guy. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it's not sportsmanlike, but, uh, <laughs> You know, the, I am, I'm a firm believer in the unfair advantage. And, uh, if it's, uh, not penalized by the rules, then it's at least worth looking into. And then, yes. if, then it just becomes a question of, of morals. Um, right. Like as far as cutting the corners of, of Catalonia. Catalonia. That was lame. That was pretty lame. How people were bypassing the, the bollards and the tire barriers. And um, by the way, if if yeah. you did that and you set like a pretty good time, just pretty like just turn the volume up really loud, real quick. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, <laughs> you deserve to be slapped on the wrist a little bit. No, I don't care. It's just funny to me. I mean, the people that go on top of the leaderboards in those times, it's always the weirdest names and like people have, that have never been there. Mm-hmm. I just want to feel like what it. You know, it's like uh, people climbing Everest and suddenly a, a magical escalator appears. You know, it's it's like people people taking a helicopter to the top of Everest, right? And they're like, I just want to feel what it's like, bro. This costs like, a I lot know. of money to do, therefore I deserve it. <laughs> and you look up at them, and you're like, I have frostbite. Yep. <laughs> my life's falling apart. I've dedicated yeah. so much. Now. My fingers are falling off from all the practice I did to get to this level, <laughs> yeah. and you just like flew in with a helicopter. <laughs> There's not enough lotion in the world for my calluses, bro. Yeah, that's the that's the kind of sacrifice that you need to make. But uh, 
Yeah, so, well, I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about our backgrounds. Mm. Cue music. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> oh, the Barry White. Mm. Oh, yeah. The Marvin Gaye. It's fine. Marvin what? Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's going to give a little spiel on myself. Keep it at five minutes. So, uh, kind of just to get it out of the way. It's early days with the podcast. You know, you can use this as a reference point to go back to mm-hmm. and be like, whoa, look at that. Remember episode four when I talked about how sexy I am? Well, <laughs> I'm way sexier now. It's crazy. Way it's really sexier. Crazy. Like at least 30% sexier. <laughs> 30? Yeah. That's probably right. <laughs> Just keeping it conservative. I mean, when you're already like a thousand percent sexy, then oh, well, yeah, know, thir- it's incremental gains. Orders of magnitude sexier. But so well, let's hear it. Let's hear about you. Yeah, thanks. Well, uh, my name's Bill. No, my name's Edward Gomez. Go by Eddie most of the time. You can call me whatever. Uh, Wardez too. That works. I started playing Gran Turismo when I was... I feel like I'm being interviewed during those backstage interviews that we did. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I started Gran Turismo with two at my friend's house. Uh, My friend Ulysses. Shoutouts. Shoutouts. He was doing the time trial. and Or no, he was doing license tests in a Viper. It was a Viper Laguna Seca. And he was like, dude, can you beat this? I'm trying to get the gold. And I'm like, okay. And... (laughs) And now do like a movie style time edit to like where I go through a wormhole of Gran Turismo and end up here. <laughs> yep. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> and uh, as soon as I picked that controller up to do that wiper license test, uh, it's just been a whole different life uh, path that I've. And been here on. you are today. Yeah. And uh, so from there, I got Gran Turismo three, and that was really fun. Super psyched on that. Had a lot of great times there, and that's how I discovered GT Planet. Uh, because I was like, man, I'm going really fast around Monaco. I bet you, I bet you that there might not be that many times ahead of me or whatever. I had like a 115 or 114 or maybe I forget what it was. And I go on check, I check GT Planet and they're like three seconds faster and it makes me like want to cry. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so that, that kind of sparked me competitively. But then after that, I, uh, yeah, I went through all the games. I got a PS3. Gran Turismo 5 was, my jam that's why i got my wheel i did play prologue but um i only had a controller and i was actually really put off by how slow i felt i feel like i couldn't get anywhere competitively online there so mm-hmm. i didn't play too much there but with gt5 i fell in with some um spec miata dudes on the forums shout outs to r1600 turbo and a lot of old names from around there that are some of them are still around which is cool but from that league i started you know i was mid-pack and i was always peed off about it so i wanted to go faster all the time started doing time trials and all that and then i got into gt academy zoomed in zoom out you know maybe a year or two i forget exactly how far 2012 was um i wasn't able i did try to go in 2011 the first time the americans were allowed in but i I didn't make it but that you know only made me want to try harder for the next year Mm -hmm. and my friend reese gold or red revos helped me big time to get the um, attitude to try hard. Mm-hmm. I did so many laps around Twin Ring Motegi. Yeah. So many laps. I watched your, your final like, fast lap um, and like right after you crossed the line I could tell you that you let go of the steering wheel and probably <laughs> exalted because the car just proceeded to hit the wall and that was, that was pretty funny. Dude, I, was ju- I jumped out of my seat and onto the back wall of my <laughs> room. It was crazy. I was so excited. And, yeah, I went to GT Academy in 2012. I went to Silverstone. Well, I went to Regionals first, then I, I got through there um, by placing top 16. Went to England, had a blast. Throughout that time, I had been running leagues on GT Planet uh, the through the Pure kind of collective that uh, Adam and Rich Castro... Uh, Tim Flaminger, who is another GT Academy guy, are all part of. And that was a lot, ton of fun. We did a lot of Super GT racing, a lot of spec racing, a lot of... Like, we did series where we BOP'd ourselves. Like, we had a, a Group 4 or GT4 series that we ran. That was, that was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. You can also check that out on my YouTube. YouTube.com slash Wardez. <laughs> and then... Um, 
after GT Academy, I got more involved with some of the GT Academy people, which was really fun, good networking there. Um, I started writing for GT Planet and became a moderator for GT Planet. Um, Jordan and I got closer, and I also got in with AJ and AJ Smith, who now runs Esports and Cars, doing uh, GT6 24-hour endurance races, which is a lot of fun. Nice. You can still check those out somewhere. I'll need to get that together. Uh, yeah, then uh, I've always been. And then I took a brief hiatus uh, after GT6. I, I only stayed on GT6 for a couple months. Then I was like, eh. I'm going to do other stuff for a couple of years. I was busy with work. I was busy with family. Uh, and then I came back for GT Sport once I got invited into the beta. And I hit it pretty hard because I felt like it was a really good game. And I, it was everything I've always wanted to have in a GT game. So yeah. Nice, dude. When you did the 24-hour endurances, were you doing it solo? Or were you doing like driver changes or what? Yeah, sweet swaps. Online sweet swaps. Uh, Lloyd's Elite was a part of that too. He was nice. always really fast. Um, but I did the commentary. There were a couple streams. I did a 12 hours of Bathurst stream all on myself, commentary the whole time. I slept for like four hours. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> then we did a 24 hour stream where I handed, I handed it off to Tom Brooks, who mm-hmm. is now the voice of GT Sport, which is insane. That's awesome. Yeah. He started out, well, he didn't start with us, but he, um, did stuff with us back in, the, in those days, which is awesome. I, I have, I've always, res- I've been respecting him. I've had the utmost respect for him ever since the first time I heard him drop his voice down for our league. Like, made me feel so like an amateur man. Like he's just so pro. Yeah, he took it so seriously. Like there was never any hesitation. Uh, was huge respect to him. I'm glad he's kicking ass doing like MotoGP stuff and all that. Yeah, for sure. And uh, I have a great respect for anyone who can. Um, figure out a way to do that in a, you know, a way that flows, that doesn't feel forced, that is communicative without saying too much. It's it's good stuff, um, and uh, yeah. we'll see we'll see if I can uh, you know cut my teeth doing the same thing. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask you when you uh, picked up the controller the first time on the Laguna Seca Viper license challenge, were you successful in getting the gold? Yeah, it took a while, but I did get it. That <laughs> was my first gold ever. Nice. Excellent, dude. Have you done any, like, uh, autocrossing? Um, any gotten into, like, carts or uh, done, like, track days, stuff like that? Yeah, I've done all of the above. Uh, I did. We have indoor karting here. I've done uh, outdoor karting in Riverside, California. That was fun. Was my, just for short friends, nothing serious. I did have my friend Brian Am- Armbrust, who was really into karting, and I could have used him to get into karting more with but i didn't take that opportunity i did autocross with a, another gran turismo friend that lived in vegas he had an insane evo that we used to that he used to autocross and he took me in a few rides there and i did some co-driving in a subaru or in a scion frs and mm-hmm. stuff like that with our vegas um scca guys and that was really fun and then track days over at button willow that i did in preparation for uh dt academy which is in a Miata, which is super fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then all the stuff in in England, with, or in Silverstone, driving a GTR and a Formula Silverstone. And it's pretty awesome, dude. You know, that, that. that racetrack is no joke. No, it's not. It's super flat, and it's extremely scary when it's raining. And the international layout, where because you go through cops. If you know cops, it's like the old starting... It used to be the first corner in F1. It's a really mm-hmm. quick right-hander. So the international layout, you make the right there, and then you go into Maggots, which is the first part of the S's. And instead of continuing on to Beckett's, you make a right, and then you get right back on to Wellington Strait, which is like the second biggest straight. Mm-hmm. And then you go into Brooklyn. So that like changeover spot in the rain, or in the wet, is ridiculously scary. So... Well, you survived. You still have all of your <laughs> limbs. You're still as handsome as ever. Thank so, you. Uh, so well done. Yeah, and enough of me. Let's get on to you and how your background is. Well, where do I start? Um, I was born into a, a family of, uh, of Porsches. My dad's um, been a jeweler all his life, and so he's been able to uh, not accrue a collection, but 
He's owned something like 20 different Porsches over the years. They're almost always the four-cylinder models, 944s, 912s. Um, he is uh, a, an autocross, local Porsche Club autocross champion from the mid-80s. Um, hill climbing champion from the like the late 80s, Northwest Hill Climb Association. And so as a little, little kid, I was uh, following him to these events all the time. Um, I have three older brothers, and, and not all of them really kind of took after it, after all. But my next oldest brother and I did. Uh, and as soon as I had a driver's license, I was out autocrossing. I think I want to say a couple weeks after getting my driver's license, I was out at an autocross. Just, you know, a parking lot in a Volvo 240, which I understand was also your first car, yeah, young man. 240. 240 represent. Um, you know, the, the bricks, the Volvo brick. It's a good car. <laughs> the DL. Yep. Um, but yeah, dude, uh, as far as like racing, uh, what's my first experience I can remember? Uh, my oldest brother got this uh, rally game on a PC uh, back when 200 megahertz was like an amazing processor speed. So that might that might date this event somewhere in the mid '90s, um, and mm-hmm. uh, all of my older brothers went over to his office uh, one night to to try it on his work computer because it's the only computer that could run it, and he didn't have a wheel; he had a joystick. And uh, oh. I forget what game it was, but it was quite realistic. Um, is it indie? I'm not sure. It was it was a rally game, um, and we were oh rally yeah, and like the Jeff Crammons. It, it could have been, yeah. The the windshield wipers worked. The, there was like a rain system. Uh, you Sounds lost like control of the car really easely. Uh, and I smoked my brothers, you know, like nine-year-old Ooh. Tristan. <laughs> um, yeah, dude. Uh, Gran Turismo demo came out, I think, around the time all my friends and I were playing like uh, GoldenEye. And I got tired of that because everyone was always playing Odd Job, and I was not any good at that <laughs> game. Um, so I, I played Gran Turismo right away. Um Man, online stuff. Uh, first online races I did, GTR 2 on PC around 2006. Um, joined an Eagle race team, and we uh, we had a lot of nights together. Um, you know, just mucking about, thinking that we're like the fastest guys out there, and then race to play. Uh, the big league that I was in for like 10 years was formed, and that's when I met people like Eduardo Prado and Connor McCarroll and David... Uh, uh, what is his last name? Um, not David Jacobs. It's, uh, oh, I can't remember, but like crazy. Uh, could have been. Could have been. <laughs> um, crazy fast people, uh, from all over the world. Uh, race to play attracted like everyone. Um, and anyone who, who was not too into iRacing went to race to play. So they had like, you know, one pond that was a little small to begin with to a bigger pond and then eventually iRacing just got crazy popular and everyone mi- migrated to it. But, um, you know, for a time, um, I mean, I, I logged, I think, like 60,000 miles on uh, Race to Play altogether uh, with some crazy endurance races. Uh, the Also did uh, Race Department, a lot of um, six, oh, yeah. eight, and ten-hour races with Race Department on, on R-Factor. Um, I mean, those oh, were maybe. awesome. Yep. I don't know if you did any of those as well. No, I never raced on there, but I, I just enjoyed the forums and all that. Yeah good bunch of guys and uh you know like people like david greco who i understand uh-huh. is is one of the lead programmers of uh the code masters now yeah um he was in those races uh i want to say bono Huys was in there i tried formula sim racing i was offered like a uh, a couple of races in the world championship series but did pretty poorly um i, I don't think i was able to, to devote enough practice time and so i was always off the pace but at least i got there so that's yeah that's great that's cool but um yeah, dude, I was equally galvanized like you once Gran Turismo Sport came out because it felt like finally there was a, a game that was halfway between the Gran Turismo that I was so familiar with and something that's hardcore realistic like iRacing um, where you can just pick up and race and uh, it's accessible to so many people because it doesn't require like a, just a huge investment. It just requires a wheel, a TV, and a PlayStation. So, um, yeah, uh, just like you, I, I went hard as soon as Gran Turismo Sport dropped. And here we are today. It's awesome. And do you have any experience with five and six? Yes, uh, I didn't play six a ton, but I played five uh, so much, so much. Um, shuffle racing was my thing. Oh, I think yeah. we've we might have covered this once before, but shuffle racing was where it was at for me. Right. Uh, I loved especially how after 
let's say you get on shuffle racing, you're particularly good to start with, you win a couple of races, and then the game gives you like a pretty crap car for the third or the fourth race, and then you have a huge handicap to overcome. And if you win those races, those are just super rewarding. Uh, the one you save the replay for and you take like a hundred pictures because you're so happy with the result. Um, the, the, uh, sort of like, it was like a step ladder of positive emotions. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed that stuff. And I, yeah. I was upset that they, they dropped shuffle racing for GT6, but yeah. maybe we'll see a comeback eventually. Hopefully. It's a great, great idea. Uh, kind of under appreciated. I, well, it has a cult following, I would say. And, but for some, whatever reason, they, I guess didn't think it was that hot of an idea when it was, but uh, yeah. So autocross is also known as auto test around the world or cone racing, whatever you want to say. Mm-hmm. Um, and the wider world of autocross in, in the United States is a really interesting one. Um, in fact, I went to Silverstone with a lot of like high profile uh, autocross guys um, that competed in the solo national competitions in kentucky or wherever they are mm-hmm. every year seca championships essentially um so one of them was nicholas barbados who i think you knew you yep. were aware of forced induction right? forced induction yeah super quick uh really really cool guy um and just so how do you think it seems like a lot of autocross guys brian high hot cotter is also like one of, known as like one of the american best guys very he, like he's known as he was like to a lot of the other guys that i talked to that were in the autocross field there was they saw him as a god of autocross mm-hmm. <laughs> and so i think aspects of autocross translate super well um because to sim racing because you don't it's not like road racing where you have a big track um there's more shuffle steering involved Mm-hmm. Right, and like, you have to be way more precise. Like, what, what would be your breakdown of skills required for being good at autocross? I think I think levels of precision are are pretty similar across the board for uh, track racing, autocrossing, sim racing. Um, you know, the more precise you are, the more you can push the boundary of the track. The more you can push the boundary of your breaking point, turn in point, throttle on point. Uh, but I think I think what autocrossing in particular offers for uh, improvement of skill set is hustling. Where right out of the box, you gotta immediately be driving like 10 tenths. Uh, and ev- everyone has a different style, but I'll just, uh, speak from personal experience. Uh, I will, uh, immediately start driving over the limits of the car, over the limits of the tires, and, uh, get sloppy sideways, lock up wheels, um, you know, not erroneously so, but in such a way where, uh, I can find the limit immediately, um, learn, learn what condition the track is in. Uh, I got to remember to breathe because I'm getting excited talking about this. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it it teaches you that um, right right from going across the start line, you have to be going as fast as possible because the lap is so short. Um, you know, most autocrosses have like a, somewhere between a 30 and 50 second uh, run, and you have to do it from a standing st- stop, um, and then you have to wait. 15, 20 minutes, or even longer, um, before you can do another one. So, uh, mental preparation, um, making sure that you're, uh, totally focused, that you don't have anything distracting you, that you have recounted in your mind in the minutes before your run, um, uh, you visualized how the run's going to go and what you're going to try differently. You think about individual corners. You are always trying to, like, whittle it away. And, uh, the warm up time once you get going, it's, it's just like a different, different kind of in the zone focus where you're like entering that state of flow immediately or at least trying to uh whereas if you're um in a a, a track driving situation let's say you're uh, going to do a two-hour race in um you know a spec miata series you're going to be hustling and driving hard right from the get-go but you're also going to be able to get away with maybe more mistakes because of the length of the race because of the size of the track uh, and with autocross, uh, the width of the track is on average like 33% that of uh, a big wide racetrack like Thunder Hill, Sears Point, Charlotte, or um, Circuit of the Americas is a good example. That's a, that's a very wide track. Um, so the, the value of precision, of uh, immediately being on the ball, uh, man, that's important. Oh, hello. Hello. 
Oh, all good. You got muted for a second? Yeah, it's all good there. We'll keep it going. Yeah. So, yeah, autocrossing. Autocrossing, I think, is the thing I've done the most aside from sim racing. Um, you know, autocrossing also has the benefit of meeting a lot of awesome people. And uh, I uh, I met my fiance autocrossing, actually. I was her first Aww. instructor. So, um... Solo, it's not solo anymore, right? No, it's, it's by solo? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what the correct term would be, but we'll, we'll roll with by solo. Yeah, Kim is awesome. Yeah, she I is. I love that story. And it's cool. I, I love your breakdown of autocross because it really brings to my mind a lot of aspects of your talent that I've appreciated. And also, uh, I remember really clearly, uh, the very first, race that I did in the GT Academy National Finals. We had it in uh, Comic-Con in San Diego Mm -hmm. and in this bar that we said they had set up the sleds in. And the very first race I had forced induction and in my it was races of four at a time. I had forced induction and two other cats Mm -hmm. in the race with me. Uh, One of the other guys I can't believe I can't remember his name right now really cool dude he was another re- very fast autocrosser so i had two like insanely quick dudes in my race to start off with and we it was crazy man it was sakuba in s14s mm-hmm. the s14 rms and as soon as the race started dude it was like they had extra horsepower they just it, it as soon as you to- started talking about how autocross is about being 10 tenths right away i was like yeah that makes sense because these two autocrossers were exactly that mm-hmm. right from the get go, and that's always been my thing. It's like it's been self, you know. It's it's a thing that I put on myself where I don't um, go. I, I don't go. I don't push it as fast as I can, as I sh- as fast as I should. So that's something that I want to work on, and that's something that I see in you when we were doing our practice races. And how the other aspect of autocross is that the track's never the same. Yeah. It's, so. it's always changing. Now, I appreciate um, your highlighting of the the positives and allowing me to have that kind of soapbox to uh, spew forth what I think is best about autocrossing. I gotta posit the possibility though that um, this uh, knack for going ten tenths right out of the out of the gate and and just trying to hustle the car immediately. Um, Maybe in another podcast it'd be worthy of a, of a lengthier discussion, but I think it has its drawbacks. Um, because if I'm hustling uh, right away and uh, I drop a wheel and I spin at turn two on the first lap, uh, I you know that's I've just thrown the weight the race away effectively. So um, you know every approach has its has its pros and cons, um, but autocrossing at least does try to force you to apply. Uh, careful precision to uh, a, a bravado of approach, if that makes any sense. You're trying to yes. find that balance all the time. Yes. And, yeah, that's one aspect of autocross that I lo- really love is precision as far as getting really close to cones and stuff. That's something that I love. Like, going, you know, threading the needle or going through some crazy sh- like city circuit chicane where it's barely wide enough for a car I love that stuff and getting as close to the guardrails as possible. That's what I'm all about. So mm-hmm. that's, uh, I feel like I should give autocross more of an effort somehow in the future, near future. It's a cool thing, dude. And you can just buy like a $500 beater and, um, you know, some cheap, cheap tires, some Sumitomos or whatever, um, you know, that are supposed to last 40,000 miles, like all season, like super hard rubber and just go out there and toss it around. Um, and, and it doesn't have to be a fast car for you to learn from it. I, I don't even think a fast car would make you learn any better. Um, I think that what's going to make you learn is just the, the application of reflection upon any circumstance of, uh, you know, car and driver combination that you've, uh, just experienced. Um, the only thing that'll keep you from learning is just simply not doing it. You hear that, folks? Wise words from the beef laying down for all of us to learn from but that'll do it for our fourth episode of Grand Trace Bros podcast I'm going to hand it off to War- uh, Road Beef uh, Tristan to take us away it's been fun thank you, you very much 
You've been listening to 104.2 WRDZ Las Vegas. If he's not spinning, he's winning. The handsome man who one day may lift off from Kazakhstan. Your coast co-host who smokes his toast with a coast-to-coast roast. Please give it up for Eddie the Juarez Gomez. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and in your fondest dreams. Thank you for listening, and good night.